I'd appreciate if you went and followed my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash 5 I'd also appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Enjoy the video. So today I'm going to be looking at Game 4 in the 2021 World Chess Championship between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomniachtchi. And before I get into the analysis, I'm just going to say that this game was played on Carlsen, the reigning world champion's birthday. And Carlsen has had some interesting results in the past on his birthday. Last year, he actually lost the finals of the Skilling Open against Wesley So on his birthday. But two years before that, uh, he was actually celebrating the his victory over Fabiano Caruana in the 2018 World Chess Championship on his birthday. And uh, one year after that, he was celebrating his victory in the 2019 Tata Steel India Rapid and Blitz event. So he's had some good results and some bad results. And in this game, Carlsen had the white pieces. And in his first game with the white pieces, which was game two of the match, if you saw the analysis for that, you would remember that Carlsen played 1d4 in that game. So in this game, however, he chose 1e4, and I think some people were expecting this because he didn't have very much success when he chose 1d4. And Nepomniachtchi already played a slightly surprising move on move 2 um, with 1e5 in response to e4 because a lot of people expected him to play the Sicilian, which would be c5, because that's just what he plays more often. Um, and I think the first big surprise was after knight f3, Nepomniachtchi played knight f6, the Petrov defense. And Nepomniachtchi, at least according to my database, has actually never played the Petrov in his entire career as a chess player. But beyond that, the Petrov just isn't the type of opening that you would expect someone like Nepomniachtchi to play. And so I think for that reason it was very surprising for people. Because Nepomniachtchi is generally known as an aggressive player, and the Petrov is a very solid opening. That being said, that's understandable, I suppose, in the setting of a world championship match, where as black, you might just want to make a solid draw, and you don't really want to go for it. So Carlsen played knight takes e5, we got d6, knight f3, knight takes e4, so far pretty standard. And here Carlsen played d4, which was possibly a little surprising. This tends to be a little more solid, whereas the approach that could play for a win or lead to more dynamic positions is instead of d4, knight to c3 here. But d4 was played. Nepomniachtchi played d5, bishop d3, bishop d6. Here there's some other options. Knight c6 is possible, bishop e7 is possible. But Nepomniachtchi played bishop d6, castles, castles, and here Carlsen played the move c4, which is a deviation from one of his other games in this line, which um, in, in which he played rook to e1. And this was a game he played against Alexei Shirov in 2006 that ended in a draw. I'll just go through the moves pretty quickly. And Carlsen got an attack, kind of a, an interesting position, but eventually it did end in a draw. So c4 was played in the game, c6 was played, and then rook to e1 from Carlsen. And knight c3 is another option here, um, which could lead to more fireworks. There's some long lines here where white has ideas of playing the move knight g5 and things can get super aggressive. I think the line is take, 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 and I believe bishop g4, queen d3, 
Um, and, and I guess here it's knight d7, knight g5, knight f6. Uh, I think it's h3, bishop h5, f4, h6, g4, take, take, knight takes, g4, takes, b5. Um, obviously this is just completely insane. And I think here white goes bishop b3. And then black goes queen d7. Um, and th this is just one option, but this has been played before. And there is a way to make a draw here, I think, after queen g4, king f2, check, king g2, queen h2, king f3, rook a to e8. And here, I think the move is bishop e3, just stopping an immediate checkmate. And I forget what the finish is, but there is some nice way that this ends in a draw. But obviously it's very complicated. And this has been played in a lot of games, but knight c3 is sharp. Um, but obviously playing a line like that is a double-edged sword, because in sharp lines there can just be forced draws like that one. Rook e1 was played in the game by Carlsen. And again, knight c3 is also possible. Bishop to f5 here was played by Nepomniachi. And uh, Carlsen has never had this position with the white pieces, but he actually did have it with the black pieces. And in that game, he played rook e8, knight c3, take, take, rook takes e1, queen takes e1, h6, c5, and eventually this game just ended in a draw. This was a game that he played as the, with the black pieces uh, 16 years ago against Andrei Volokitin, who's a Ukrainian player. So Bishop f5 was played in the game, and here Carlsen played queen b3. And I do think if you're trying to improve or like trying to get something interesting, this is actually a pretty interesting moment in this chess game uh, that I think probably people can learn from. So here queen d7 was played. Um, and knight a6 is a more common move. Um, I put one game in here between Evgeny Nayer with the white pieces and Fabiana Caruana, who is a big proponent of the Petrov. Um, and uh, in the actual game, though, knight c3 was played, and after takes... Um, white played bishop takes f5, queen takes f5, and this is a really important moment in the game, um, because white could have played the move queen takes b7. And queen takes b7 attacks a rook, um, so it, it does make a serious threat. And it looks like this rook is just trapped, so black seems to be in trouble, but they do have two options to try to save the game, and both of these options have been played in high-level games. Um, one of those options is knight to e4, and after queen takes a8, now queen d7, and this queen is trapped. And there was a game between Fabiano Caruana with the black pieces once again, and Sergei Karyakin that continues as follows. Some craziness, but it did end in a draw. And also a game um, between uh, Maxim Vache Lagrave with the white pieces and Fabiana Caruana once again with black, um, where here the move queen to d7 was played. Queen d7 was played in this game uh, between Vache Lagrave and Caruana. It looks like you can take this rook, but that would actually be a losing move, because now black can play the move knight a4. And this threatens knight to b6, which traps the queen. And you can play c5, which prevents that, but now just knight to a6. And again, the queen is trapped, it's under attack, so you'd have to sacrifice. And now black just has a queen for, well, a queen and a minor piece for two rooks. So black is just winning. So that's not an option for... Uh, white and so they would have to trade queens on d7 and there have been a bunch of games played here and here white can take on c3 but the most accurate move is c5 
and then black gives up their bishop on h2 to win a pawn, and there was a game um, between Vache Lagrave and Caruana that continued as follows and eventually ended in a draw. So, b takes c3 was the move that Carlson played in the game. He decided he didn't want any of this, and he probably assumed that Napomniachi had looked at this enough um, that Carlson would not be able to get an advantage in that line. So he played b takes c3, b6 was played here, and here Carlson chose c takes d5. Uh, Bishop g5 is the more common option, which was seen in a game between Vichy Anand, the former world champion, and Jan Christoph Duda in 2019, and continued as follows, and here Anand decided to keep queens on the board with queen e2. This game eventually ended in a draw, however. So c takes d5 was played in the game, c takes d5, and queen b5. Uh, another option would be bishop a3, which was played in the game between Svidler and Kramnik, two strong players in 2007. Um, but this kind of just ended in a draw pretty quickly. The players agreed on a draw here. It's just completely equal. So, uh, queen b5 was played, queen d7, and here Carlsen had some options. And in the game he played the move a4, which I think is maybe slightly inaccurate. Um, maybe not slightly inaccurate, but I I think in the game this move ended up helping Napomniachi more than Carlsen, and I'll get into that later. But one option here was queen takes d7, of course, just trading queens right away, because um, a4 doesn't really avoid a queen trade, it just makes it happen in a different way uh, that transforms the structure. But queen takes d7 is also an option, and um, Fabiano Caruana, one of the commentators, were, was analyzing a line like this, where White has this weak c3 pawn, but it's not a huge problem, and black also has a weak d5 pawn, which white can try to take advantage of. And this seemed to be fine for Carlsen. Another option is the move rook to b1 here, which was played in another game between Maxime Vashi Lagrov and Fabiano Caruana in 2017, which also ended in a draw. So, a bunch of different options. Uh, here, a4 was played. And this move has a clear idea. This rook is staring down the other rook. Uh, there's a staring contest being had on the a file here. And white is trying to say that after this trade, this rook is just a better piece than this rook because this rook is stuck defending the pawn now. And so this rook wins the staring contest because this rook is forever going to be stuck defending a7. Whereas this rook is active, it can always just move away from the a file if it wants. And white can also just bring another rook, put more pressure on this pawn. But here Napomniachi played a really nice move, which is a5. And now all of a sudden, this pawn is no longer a weakness. Um, and it's, it's suddenly a strength. The a7 pawn now moving to a5 is now a passed pawn, and it can try to run down the board. And now this rook is sort of the winner of the staring contest, because now this rook is stuck defending against this pawn pushing forward, whereas this rook can always move away, because the a6, the a5 pawn is defending, defended by the b6 pawn. So... Um, in this case, Napomniachi kind of flipped the script. Also, I should mention that instead of queen takes d5, uh, queen takes b5, there was one game here that followed rook d8, g3, bishop c7, um, bishop g5, f6, bishop d2, knight c6, and white managed to get an advantage here. I believe white played the move c4. And um, this was a game between Michael Adams and Alexander Morozevich, two very strong players. It ended in a win for White. So I think for that reason, again, trading queens was the right decision. And so a5 was played here. 
and so this was another important moment in the game where Carlson played the move knight to h4, which is really a very interesting move. I'm not sure that it's necessarily a super strong move, and I think a lot of the commentators during the game sort of overestimated this move, because it does look very interesting, because there's an idea to go knight to f5 and attack this bishop, start putting pressure over here. And additionally, there's the idea which Carlson played in the game, uh, after Nepomniachi played the move g6, which prevents knight f5, then Carlson played g4. And the idea here, well, really there are a lot of ideas. One idea is to bring the knight back to g2, and from there it can go to e3, put pressure on this pawn, it can also maybe go to f4, or the bishop can come to f4, try to create a trade. Um, there's also ideas of going g5 and really clamping down and taking space, or bishop h6 followed by g5. Basically, there are just a lot of interesting ideas for white here. And so knight h4 is definitely very interesting. That being said, um, one of the commentators, Anish Giri, sort of had a theory that Maybe Carlson's team looked at this idea, uh, but didn't realize or, or didn't look deep enough to understand that, as it turns out, this doesn't really provide any advantage for white. Uh, white has some interesting ideas, but it's not really enough. Um, you know, even if black plays slightly suboptimally, they're still doing pretty okay. <laughs> they don't need to be super precise here. And so I think Carlson's team was maybe leaving it up to Carlson to figure it out as sort of the endgame genius. Um, but as it turns out, while this idea is very interesting, it's not necessarily enough. I should say also that another option here that Carlson could have played that would have been just fine, um, although not anything special, would be the move just B takes A6, uh, taking this pawn, and then after Knight takes A6, uh, you might get something like bishop a3, take take, knight c7, and this is just really roughly equal. Both sides have some weaknesses, so it'll probably just end in a draw. So, in the game, knight h4 was played, and g6, g4, and Carlson just continues his plan, knight d7, knight g2, and here, rook f to c8, and I think this was a nice move from Pomniachi, showing that he clearly looked at this opening quite a bit, um, because one tempting move here is knight to f6. And firstly, also, there's just the move rook a to c8, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think the main reason why rook f to c8 is better is because you want to have the rook behind the a pawn, but I do think that that is also a little counterintuitive because it doesn't really feel like the a pawn should be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so I think rook a to c8 is a very human move here because the rook on f8 could be helpful. You might even go f5 at some moment, although for now white would have g5, um, but then maybe f4, who knows? It's, it's an idea. Or you could just put this rook on e8 and d8 or d8, um, which is also possible. So that's why I think rook a to c8 is also something that most people would consider. Um, and also knight f6 here. Knight f6 is really, I think, the human move because it just attacks g4. It also defends the d5 pawn, um, which could be attacked in the future. But here, there's a nice computer line which gives uh, white a pretty pleasant position. Uh, they can play bishop h6, and now on a move like rook f to c8, very natural, just moving the rook away, attacking a pawn, now you can go knight to e3. And now if black grabs this pawn, there's g5. And now the knight has to move away, and you can take on d5, and suddenly 
this king is kind of stuck and white has attacking ideas, knight e7 check is possible, b6 is kind of loose, knight f6 check is possible. So white is doing pretty well here, I would say. I think from a practical perspective, this position is pretty unpleasant for black. So rook f to c8 was a nice move. And bishop to f4 was played here by Carlson. And here takes was played. Uh, there's one computer suggestion here, which is pretty hard for a human to play, which is bishop to b8, just keeping the tension between the bishops. Um, but I, I don't think it's so important to really get into that. And it doesn't make black's position any better, really. So just kind of a strange computer move. Um, bishop takes f4 is, was played in the game. Uh, knight takes f4. Rook takes c3, knight takes d5. And here Carlson kind of had a choice between, or sorry, Nepomniachi kind of had a choice between rook b3 and rook d3. Because both moves attack a pawn and put pressure on Carlson's position. And rook b3 was possible. Um, and I think also Carlson seemed a little surprised when uh, rook to d3 was played. So it's possible that he was expecting rook to b3. But I don't necessarily think that this is a great move just because, for one, you're not actually threatening to take this pawn. There's a knight c7 for glooming. Um, and also white has time to go for rook e7, g5, knight f6, all the ideas that they want. Um, so this is just fine for white. Um, Although, I can't say that rook d3 is too much different. Okay, uh, someone requested a dab, so there you go. Um, I, I might forget to edit this out of the YouTube video, so if I do, then hello YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the dab. Uh, if you come over to twitch.tv slash 5 you too can make me dab. Uh, for the low price of 250 channel points, so <laughs> so yeah, there's your there's your ad to come over to Twitch. Um, do a reverse Ludwig. So rook d3 was played in the game. Uh, rook to e7, and here uh, knight f8 was played, and knight f6 check. And here, Carlson could have taken on b6, but now after rook b8, uh, you would just have to move the knight back. And uh, rook takes b5 could be played. And here, it's just basically equal. Although, I'd say if anyone's playing for the win, it's probably black. They have this past a pawn, the d pawn's weak, the g pawn is kind of loose. You can also go for like rook b2 and rook d2 at some moment and start putting pressure. So, I don't think Nepomniachi, or, uh, sorry, I don't think Carlson wanted to go into this. So, knight f6 was played in the game, and here king g7, and Carlson decided to go knight e8, um, king g8, and here he played the move d5, which is interesting. You can't take this pawn because of knight f6, and Carlson's just trying to run his d pawn down the board because, okay, Nepomniachi has a passed pawn, but so does Carlson. And here, a4 is a really important move from Nepomniachi. From a, a conceptual perspective, I think it shows a lot of understanding because here, if you let Carlson, um, if you, if you let Carlson make some moves, you know, you give him some moves, he can start to activate his pieces, like rook a4 is an idea, for instance. That's very interesting. He can throw the h-pawn up the board even. He can get knight f6 and g5. Um, so there are some ideas that make this a little dangerous for black, so it's really important that black gets play going as quickly as possible with this pawn. Because once you get this pawn rolling down the board, then um, white is the one who sort of has to be on the defensive because this pawn 
is just very strong, and there are ideas to make it into a queen, um, and then white might have to drop their rook back to try to defend, but then suddenly, you know, white is not, certainly not playing for the win. Looks like a puzzle rush. Um, I guess, sort of, yes. Um, well, definitely a puzzle rush would be rook takes d5 and knight f6 check. <laughs> Picking up the rook, that's definitely a puzzle rush. Um, so a4, knight f6 check. King to g7 was played. Um, and here Carlson planted the knight with g5. Um, but the problem is, again, Napomniachi is just pushing this pawn down the board. And he's threatening ideas like a2 and rook b3, threatening rook b1, and, and this is really getting quite dangerous. And for that reason, Carlson actually decided to just make a draw here. He just went back and forth, and the game ended in a draw. And I'm just going to quickly look at some of the other possibilities that could have happened here instead of the game just ending in a draw. I don't think any of them would have really given Carlson an advantage. I think... Uh, it's just equal anyway. Also, I should quickly mention, the reason that this is a forced draw is that um, basically the king is in this little box where it has to go back and forth. You could try putting the king on h8 here, for example, um, but now f7 is, is hanging, um, and additionally Carlson can just go back to f6, and, well, yeah, now f7 is hanging for real. Because if you take on f7 here, you lose your knight. But if you play a move like a2 here, then rook takes f7. And suddenly there's ideas to go like rook takes a2. Like rook b3 would blunder rook takes a2. Um, so, yeah. There are, there are some interesting ideas here. Um, so basically Carlsen is, is holding on. King h8 was not really an option. Or at least it was, but I think it's just too dangerous for black. Um, so the players had some other... Uh, there were some other ways that the game could go. Uh, some other things that Carlson could have done. So d6 was one move that actually the players were analyzing after the game. Um, but it seemed like after knight e6 d7, rook d8, black is just fine. Because basically, this pawn is not going anywhere. You can play rook e8, but this doesn't actually do anything. Sorry. Obviously not rook takes e8. <laughs> that would be a huge blunder. Um, but, yeah, otherwise, uh, there's just not really anything going on here. And black can play a move like h6, for example. Um, really, they have a lot of options here. Additionally, they can even just take this pawn, because uh, if you take on d8, then black takes on d8. If you take on d7, then black takes on d8, and they've actually just won a pawn. <laughs> so that's another option. Um, and now white could sacrifice the exchange back, but this is just a draw. Um, so essentially, this wouldn't have given anything to white. Um... You do have to be a little careful here. I mean, you can't play knight takes g5 here, for example, because now rook e8, and now this is a problem, um, because white is just going to make a queen. Black is still not lost here, because they're attacking f6, but there's really no reason to go into this. Um, so another option... Um, instead of d6 was the move h4, which is also very interesting here. And there's ideas to go h5 at some moment and really push the pawn down the board, try to take space for white. Um, but here, probably the simplest move for black would just be to play the move h5. And now this pawn's never going anywhere. If you take, well, you lose your knight. So that's not an option either. Um, and now these pawns are just all frozen, and it's just, you know, equal regardless. Um, 
So, yeah. And then another option, white could just, like, pass a move here and play a move like king g2. Um, sort of maybe hoping that white goes, or black goes a2, and then white can go rook e2. And here, black's rooks are kind of stuck defending this pawn, which might give white some chances to play, like, rook d2 and get their d pawn down the board. Um, but black doesn't even have to do this. They could just play a move like h6 here, or h5, or, or anything, really. Um, so, yeah. Not anything, obviously, but they have a lot of moves that would more or less maintain equality. Um, but Carlson decided to go for the draw in the game. Thank you for tuning into the analysis. I hope you enjoyed it.